All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming this evening and welcome to the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. Uh, my name is Joseph Rogers. I am the Manager of Partnerships and Community Engagement here at the museum, and it is a pleasure to be with you here today to discuss uh, the lecture, to attend the lecture and the panel discussion on the life and legacy of an enslaved Virginian, Emily Winfrey. Uh, and I think that it's quite appropriate, in fact, that we are gathered here on this day, this week, right before Juneteenth. I mean, after all, what better way to start this celebration off by talking about a woman who lived through enslavement and grew through it with her family in tow, came out on the other side, and has endowed us with a legacy of people who are able to carry that on and carry on her spirit, because that is truly what all of this means to us. As we look at Juneteenth as a memory of moving forward, we also look at, for those of us who live in the city of Richmond, our April 3rd, our own personal Juneteenth, which would have been very important for Emily herself, as that is the day that Union troops entered into the city of Richmond and ended slavery in the city. And so as we think about that part of the legacy, as we think about this moving forward, as we think about all the people who were able to live these, these new unshackled lives, uh, it is impressive that we get to do so uh, here in this city and with the descendants of the Winfrey family themselves. Uh, so I do want to thank you for joining us today as we get started. Um, but these are part of our banner lecture series uh, here at the museum. Uh, we, are, we have a lot of them that come on up. We, in fact, have one coming up next week as well. Uh, so next Thursday, you can join us and historian Samantha Rosenthal for a lecture about the LGBT community in Roanoke, Virginia, and how queer people today think about the past and how history lives on in the present with our banner lecture uh, at 6 p.m. next Thursday, Living Queer History. And, of course, as a... Uh, a queer person from Roanoke, Virginia myself. I'm excited to see uh, and hear a little bit more about that. Uh, so I encourage you all, if you are able to make it out tonight, uh, to please come out next week as well. Uh, but without any further ado, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Jan Meck, uh, who is the co-author, along with uh, Virginia Refro, the, uh, our, for the, uh, the book itself. Uh, so a little bit about Dr. Meck. Uh, she was raised in Northern Virginia. She received her BS from Michigan State University, her MS from VCU, and her PhD from the University of Texas. She spent 30 years as a medical research scientist for NASA in Houston. And uh, after her retirement, she returned to Virginia and left her career as a scientist behind. She became a docent at the Virginia Historical Society, now the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, and soon made it her mission to uncover and tell the stories of African-American Virginians. Emily Winfrey's story is, and saving her cottage became part of that mission and started a five-year journey, which resulted in the book that she will discuss today. So if you will please welcome up to the stage, Dr. Jan Mack. Thank you so much, Joseph. I don't know if I can get through that without crying. That was very inspiring. I'll see if I can top that with my little talk today. I want to also thank everybody for coming out and celebrating Emily Winfrey's life and legacy. Um, before we even begin, we have to start thanking some people. And the first person I need to thank is Virginia Refo. So I, I asked her if she'd stand up and just turn around because she'll be. <laughs> she is actually the brains behind this whole thing. I had this big idea and I went down to the Library of Virginia and I found some some census records and I found some deeds and I thought, man, I am really hot. How hard could this, how hard could this be? <laughs> and within about three hours, I was just stuck. So she is an experienced genealogist and she came and volunteered to help me. And the things that she came up with are really the meat of this book. So we made a good team um, and got this 
finally put together five years later. So that's, that's my friend and colleague, Virginia. We also need to thank this organization. It was Jamie Boscott uh, who came here in 2017 and supported this all along the way, had the reception for the family members when we found them, started asking me and, and all of these questions about the Winfrey Cottage, and I realized I really didn't know that much about it, and that's what, what was set me out on my mission. The Chesterfield Historical Society, most of this story took place in what was then Chesterfield County, when Manchester was in Chesterfield County. The Library of Virginia, who was tremendously helpful. Manchester Lodge number 14. Uh, some of them, did anybody from the lodge come today? They said they were going, going to come, but they went to extraordinary efforts to help us, even to the extent of drilling open their safe to try to find an original photograph of Emily when my publisher uh, kept saying the one I had was no good. And I said, well, it's only an inch big. What, what do you want? So <laughs> they never did find it, though. Chesterfield County Courthouse Records Department went down. This lady went down with her own cell phone and took pictures for me. Uh, the Chesterfield County Clerk's Office did the same thing for me. And most of all, the Winfrey family members who have been extremely helpful in um, this endeavor. And we have two of them here, Dr. Kim Mitchell and Robert Goins. Could you guys just stand up for a second and wave so they'll know, know who you are? And Kim is going to be on the panel with us a little bit later and give our family, fam, her family's perspective of this, this whole endeavor. So who was Emily Winfrey? She was born in enslavement around 1834. We're not positive that that's her birth date. She was owned by a man named Jordan Branch, who happened to be the brother-in-law of David C. Winfrey. Uh, Jordan Branch was a sheriff for 20 years in Petersburg. We know she and her oldest daughter, Mariah, were sold at an auction in 1858 after Branch died. And by 1860, and actually July 6th, 1860, she was then owned by David Winfrey. In 1866, David gave her a cottage, this little cottage that's been the subject of all of this research, in Manchester. He also gave her 109.5 acres out of a farm that he owned, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. And that was in Chesterfield County. After his death in 1867, she became destitute. By that time, she had five children. She had these two properties, um, but she had no means of support. And Emily died in 1919. So the first record that we found of Emily was after Jordan Branch's death in 1857. He died in test state. So she uh, appeared on an appraisal. All of his property had to be appraised, had to go up for auction. So the first record we have of Emily is right here where you see the little arrow. It says, Emily, Marianne's child, 20 years old, with a, another child, Mariah. Now this Mary Ann, which you see above here, Mary Ann, another child, three years old. Here's Sam, Mary Ann's child, Reuben, Mary Ann's child, Emily, Mary Ann's child. This was a whole family. Now this was a Mary Ann, Mary Ann Stokes, she turned out to be. And although Emily kept in touch with the Stokes family, we have, other than this, it says she's Mary Ann's child, we have no proof of actually who her mother and father were. Um, after the inventory, they set up an auction at Jordan Branch's brother's Branch and Sons store. Branch and Sons were people that they auctioned off slaves. They, they hired, uh, offered hiring contracts for, for enslaved people, and they had an auction of Jordan's estate. And I think it's really interesting to say at the last of this, these are family servants and are sold for no fault but to settle up the estate. So they were speaking well of these people, but they said they just had to settle up the estate. So we actually have the records where Emily and Mariah were sold. They were bought by E.B. Hutchinson, Emily and one child, 
for $1,025. And you can see that a lot of these people, here's Mary Ann and the children, were bought back by the Branch family. So the only one that was separated was Emily and Mariah. So why was that? We're not sure. But they weren't bought by David Hunt, uh, Winfrey. They were bought by this E.B. A. B. Hutchinson. We're not sure who that is. We know there are a lot of Hutchinsons in the area that were slave traders, slave dealers, and perhaps he was a, an agent for David. Um, perhaps David was sick because he was a sick person. Um, but we don't, know, we don't know who this Hutchinson is. But we do know that 18 months later, here she is. Here's D.C. Winfrey, a slave census of Chesterfield County. The second item is a 24-year-old female black and a 4-year-old female mulatto and a six, I think that's a 6-month-old female mulatto. And we're pretty sure this is Emily and Mariah and the second daughter, Betty, Elizabeth Winfrey. So by this time, they were living out in Chesterfield County on this big farm that David owned. So who was this David Winfrey guy? He was from a very prominent county uh, family in Chesterfield County. They were here since the 1700s. They owned a lot of land. They owned a lot of people. They had a lot of power. He was on the board of a couple of banks in Richmond. His father was, not David. So David uh, went to University of Virginia and graduated with honors in the sciences, and then he went to the University of Pennsylvania and got a medical degree. But we don't have any evidence that he ever practiced medicine because on every record we found he shows up as a farmer. We do know that he fathered several children, we think six, by enslaved women before Emily. And we, don't have, we couldn't find any of them. They were only listed by a first name. He died in 1867, and he never married. So by the year 1864, now he was, we first found in 1860, by 1864, they had another child, Walter David, who was born in 1862. So now there's three children, Mariah, Betty, and Walter David. In the June of 1864, David decided to join the Confederate Army. He joined in Fahrenholtz Reserves. Um, Fahrenholtz Reserves was mostly captured at Sailor, the Battle of Sailor's Creek on, during Lee's retreat. But David was not on that retreat because he had shown up in December of 1864 in the hospital, in the Confederate hospital in Farmville, with advanced syphilis. And this is, a, this is one of the things that I tell you, Virginia, she found this. I said, I want to know how, what happened to David. Why why did he die? Next thing I know, she's got the original handwritten record by the doctor that diagnosed him. Um, he had syphilitic rheumatism of long-standing duration. He was deemed exceedingly delicate. He was sent to Jackson Hospital in Richmond and uh, later very soon discharged. So he's unfit for duty. Two months later, realizing that he was very seriously and terminally ill. He tried to sell that farm in Chesterfield County on which they were living. Um, it did not sell. But it's interesting. I, I like to, to always think about, when I think about Emily, well, what was she thinking? What was going through her mind? What was really the environment? Emily isn't just a bunch of documents and papers and medical records. And if you look down at the bottom there, where I have that arrow, it said it is proper to state that the above property has not been nor is likely to be depredated by the armies that are in the area, because they said they're not fighting near this area. But think about trying to sell a piece of property and having to put a little note in that, oh, we know there's a, a massive war going on nearby, but we're pretty sure it's not going to disrupt this and your house won't be burned down, so please buy this property. Well, nobody bought that. <laughs> And so it did not sell. So now we're in the siege of Petersburg during this time. And you've got to wonder, what is she thinking? She's left all those people behind that I showed you. Did they evacuate when the branches evacuated? Petersburg was pretty much evacuated. Did they come to visit her? Was she allowed to go visit them? Did she even know wh where they were? Did she know that, that the troops were closing in? 
Was she longing for her freedom? Did she think, oh, finally I'll be free? Or was she afraid of her freedom? So many people, when they became free, were just, they had nowhere to go, they had no money, they had no education, they had no job. So what, you know, what was she thinking here? Um, where would she go after the war? In March, which was the month after that, uh, the, the farm didn't sell, David advertised for a overseer for this farm. And in that advertisement, he states that, you see the capital, washer, ironer, and cook. Well, that was Emily. And it says now we have four small children. So they now had James Wiley, who was born in 1865. James Wiley happened to be David's father's name. We don't know if he got the overseer or not. In 1866, after the war, after freedom, another son, Henry, was born. In March of 1866, David bought this cottage for Emily in Manchester. It was on 8th and, P 8th and Porter Streets. And we actually have a map we, with her name, Mrs. Winfrey, in this little square on 8th and Porter Street. That's now Commer 8th, 8th Street is now Commerce Avenue. In May of 1866, he gave her a piece of that farm. He had to split it up to try to sell it. And he gave her 109.5 acres of that farm. He gave her exclusive rights to this, these properties. She could sell them. She could rent them out. If she sold them, she could use the money any way that she, she saw fit. She could give them upon her death to anybody she chose, even if it wasn't her children. So it was very very clear and distinct that he wanted her to have these properties. Um, she was also given a trustee. She couldn't read or write, and we, we consulted with a, a, an historian about this, and they said, he said, yeah, he was, he was definitely trying to protect her. He had somebody to look out for her. And it seems from what we could tell that the series of trustees, she had five because they kept dying on her, but they seemed like they were trying to do right by her. But the problem was, because she had this trustee, every time she wanted to do something the prop with the property, she had to unite with that trustee and they had to go to court. And that wasn't free. So it ended up costing her a large amount of money because she had this trustee every time she tried to do something with the property, proper, a, any of the properties. So this is a picture of where the cottage ended up. Um, that's obviously not Manchester. That is Shaco Bottom. This is the VCU parking lot here. This is the Lumpkins jail site. Main Street uh, Station is back over here, and the train shed that they renovated is back over there. And that was saved from destruction 20 years ago, and it's been sitting, it was at the, behind the Exxon station, but it's basically been sitting on those rails for 20 years. It's owned by the city now. But the thing about it is that if she hadn't had those properties, if she hadn't had to go to court every time she wanted to do something with those properties, there wouldn't be these records. We found a huge file of every piece of, pro of, of uh, paper that was involved. We have all the deeds, all the petitions, much more than, than we could even put in the book. Notes from David's nephew, all kinds of, all, all kinds of documents because of those houses. In March of 1867, David died. And we're pretty sure he died of syphilis. So now what was she going to do? Here she's got five children now. She doesn't have any income. She's got these properties kind of sitting in her back prop, uh, pocket. She's living in, in one of them. The urban legend was she was living in one room of the cottage and renting out the other room, but it turned out that that wasn't ex exactly right. She had these five small children. The properties were accruing taxes, which was a problem in her, in her later time. So what options did she have? She had some options. She could apply for aid from the Freedmen's Bureau, which we know, we know that she did. We have those records. She could rent out her house and move to the country. She could find work, obviously, for herself and as the children grew for the children. And she could sell her properties. And it turns out she did all of those things. We have records from every, every one of them. 
This is a page from the Freedmen's Bureau ration book. And you can see Emily's way down here. It says Emily Winfrey. She was living in Manchester. We were never able to make out the rest of this, but I imagine that's showing that she has all of these children and she was receiving rations. So right after David died, in August of 1867, was the first time that we have record that she went to court. So her trustee, A.A. A. Allen, and she decided that she should sell some timber and build a house and move out to the country where it would be cheaper. So these are, this is just a small portion of the petition that he sent in. She has five small children. The only income is rent of the house, which is utterly inadequate for the support of her children. The land is yielding nothing. And he said if authority be granted to sell some wood and cut timber, she might erect a building and then being able to move out to the country where the cost of living would be cheaper. And he says, I concur in the petition and think no other way can keep her and her children from suffering. So we know that she did that. This is a an, an, uh, ration book uh, uh, from the Freedmen's Bureau. Here's an, another from another entry. Here she is, she's living in the country. So this is Manchester, but she's now living in the country and it says, very destitute, sick, five children, five small children. So we know that she did that, and we actually have the record that she built a house out there. But it didn't, for some reason, it didn't work out for her because by 1870, she was back in Manchester. So this is a page from the census. You can see it's Manchester. And here she is, Winfrey Emily, and she's a domestic servant. So she has Mariah. Elizabeth, uh, Walter David, James Wiley, and Henry. And now we have a child, Clifford. Now, we, Clifford, it says, in 1870 was less than a year old, which means he was born 1868, 1869. If that's accurate, he wasn't David Winfrey's child. If the Census Bureau made a mistake and mistook him because he was small or something, it still could be Winfrey's child. And on, on Clifford Winfrey's death certificate, it says David Winfrey is his father. And you can see that Mariah, this child that was sold with her, is now 14, and Elizabeth is 11. And so they're obviously staying home, taking care of, of these four boys while their mom is out trying to bring in enough money. We don't know why she had to come back to Manchester, but she, but she did. We also have record of her employment. This is a page from the book, The History of Manchester Lodge Number 14. And this is where we got this picture. They took this picture of Emily. And they thought so much of her that they devoted a whole page of their history book to her. And they called her Aunt Emily. And the possum, it was called the Possum Lodge. And the story goes that after the war, they didn't have any money, so instead of cooking turkeys for celebrations and Thanksgivings, they had to cook possum. And she said that, um, it says, numerous opossums have Aunt Emily prepared for the lodge. And they call her a polite mulatto, an efficient cook, and she has prepared many suppers. And she worked for them for 33 years. So we were, we were thinking, well, could this have been a full-time job? And we actually asked them. As I said, they've been very helpful. They said, no, she would have just come over for, to cook a supper or something like that. And I said, could she have possibly lived there? No, she couldn't have lived there. She just was the cook, and she came over. But possibly she was able to take home food from time to time, which was kind of a little fantasy I put in, in part of the book. And we actually have this receipt or this record from November 4th, 1890. It was um, refreshments for the rewards committee, committee of Manchester Lodge number 14. And here they have paid $1 to Aunt Emily to prepare this meal. They paid Emily $1. They also paid $1 a gallon for oysters back in those days. That's considered trash food. So we know that, that she worked for them for many, many years. Now, I know this looks terrible. This is the 1880 census, but it's important because it has now. Mariah has left, and in, in 1878, she married John Walker, but she's still in the neighborhood. She's still around. 
Betty is now 20, Walter's 18, and James is 15, and they're all working, so they're starting to contribute now. And we have, I know you can't read this, but this says Emily Winfrey, servant. This is Betty, servant. Walter is a driver, and we can't read what James is, and Henry is at school, so he's got, she's got this kid in school. In 1885, all of them got sick, and they were sick for a year. They were treated by Dr. Ingram, who lived in the neighborhood. It was a very mixed neighborhood, and he, she owed him $36, and she couldn't pay him, and he eventually had to go to court to try to get them to release the money from her trust that she had there. So if they were seriously ill and could not work. We don't know what they had. I looked it up, and the two big killers that year were, eight, uh, were diphtheria and consumption, which is uh, TB. But we don't know. It, it could have been syphilis. Um, this led to further financial difficulties for them, and in 1886, she took measures to sell those properties. She had held on to, him, to them eight, ten, since 1867. I said 1866, I meant 1886 she sold them. So she decided to sell the acreage. So she and her, her uh, trustee had to unite, she had to unite, unite with her trustee and go to court and ask permission to sell the property. We have, we have uh, documents where they had to bring witnesses in and interview them and they had to say, yes, this is the best thing to do. It's not making any money. It would be best for her to sell the property. So they got permission to sell the land at auction. And they had an auction on January 10th of the next year, but it did not sell. So they went back to court, and the court said, well, since it didn't sell, you can sell it privately. And they sold it to a man named L.K. Woodbury. And he was to make five payments, which he did. And the proceeds went into a bank trust fund assigned by the court. So we actually know, well, I'm sorry, this is, the, this, is the, uh, this is the flyer for the sale, and you can see it has a small frame house. So that's, that tells us that she did go out there, and she built that house like she said she was going to, and she uh, lived in it, and then she returned to Manchester. We actually have a receipt from the State Bank of Virginia where this Woodbury... So these were the last two payments that he made in 1890. By now, her, her trustee is P.V. Cogbill. That was the last one that she had. And so once that she got those, that last payment, she turned the property over, and we actually have the deed that uh, gave it to Woodbury. She also sold a house, and this is when we found out that there were actually two structures on that property. It was a very tiny little, little lot, but we now know that she sold one of them, and the other one, which she was still living in, she took out a mortgage or bo borrowed $560 on it. So now she had $560, and she had the money from the, the sale of the, of the land in the bank. We don't know what she did with those with those the 560 because that didn't appear in the uh, trust later on she got behind in her payments so her trustee went to court again and asked if he could take the money out of the trust fund at the bank and pay off the notes so that she wouldn't lose the house but taxes were accruing David's heirs, for some reason had to relinquish any claim to those monies before she could do that which we Virginia and I never really understood because it said very clearly that she could do whatever she wanted uh, with it. But nevertheless, the court required that, and we were lucky enough to have this note from David's nephew, David Branch. Now, David Branch was Jordan Branch's son. David Branch grew up in the house with Emily Winfrey in Petersburg, and we thought perhaps he was Mariah's father because they would have been similar age. We don't know any of that, but we do know that he wrote this note that said, Dear Emily, not Dear Mrs. Winfrey, not you know, to whom it may concern, Dear Emily, yours dated the 11th instant and mailed in Manchester the 24th, reached me the 25th with enclosures, which is what he was supposed to sign. 
I have very cheerfully signed the papers and returned it to you in this. Glad I could be of that much service to you. Hope you will get it promptly and in good time. That's a very revealing little note that he wrote. That's a very friendly note. It, that's the only communication we have between David's other family and Emily. So the next census we have is 1900. 1890 was lost in a fire. This is one of the reasons I had to have Virginia because I was down at Library of Virginia. I was making such good progress. I found them in the census, and I found the 1880 census, and I went up to the desk, and I said, now I need the 1890 census. And they said, it burned up in a fire. I said, no, I need it. I have to. <laughs> what do you mean? The, all the census burned up in a fire. So uh, that's when I knew I was in trouble and went and got Virginia. So we do have the 1900 census. Um, by this time, uh, Clifford is, oh, I say he's back at home, but he, had, he hadn't appeared in the 1881. Now we have Lucy appearing for the first time. James is a cook. Henry's a laborer. Clifford and Lucy have both become school teachers. So she's, these were the two youngest and they became school teachers. Clifford became quite a leader in the community. Uh, Lucy went to Hampton Institute, actually. Betty is married and moved to Rhode Island. Betty was very, very white. Mariah was very, very white, too. And she, she married a white guy and moved to Rhode Island, and in all the census records, she appears as a, as a, a, that's a white family. They had one daughter who they named Emily, and she was also listed as white. Um, so now they're all living on Stockton Street. Walter, down here at the bottom, he's married, so now he's head of household, and he's become an upholsterer, so he got a, he got a um, career. So we have a cook, we have a laborer in a railroad shop, and two school teachers and an upholsterer. And by now, they're all living on Stockton Street. Now, they moved around on Stockton Street. This is 1515 Stockton. This is the last house that she lived in. She was living here when she died. Do we have a fire alarm? Oh. I just put this little map in here just to show you. Here's where Emma, Emily's cottage first started. It was 8th and, and Porter. This is where Clifford lived for many, many years. But this was the new edition. This was called Mark's Edition that went up, and this is Stockton Street. So you can see the family all stayed within a couple blocks of each other, and they went up and down Stockton until finally the house was per They purchased that house on Stockton Street. Lucy actually bought it, and they lived there. Uh, she lived there until she died. This is her death certificate. Now, a death certificate, she says, it says she was born in 1842. On her tombstone, it says she was born in 1834. Um, and it says her parents are John W. Scott and Emily Jones. We couldn't find either of those people. We came up with scenarios of who they could be, but it definitely wasn't Marianne Stokes, wasn't one of them. Um, and the person that informed the the death certificate was Cliff, her son Clifford, who was educated, and she was buried in Mount Olivet Cemetery, which became Maury, part of Maury Cemetery. And this is her gravestone. Her son James bought a family plot. You can see it's surrounded by stone. Several of her children, and I think Clifford's wife was is buried there as well. And it's, look at it, it says, uh, "In loving memory of our beloved mother." So they went to the expense to put that up. So just to recap, her children were Mariah, Betty, Walter, James, Henry, Clifford, and Lucy. The reason Mariah and Lucy are in different fonts, because those, those are the descendants that we found. We didn't find any of the, of the others. Betty, um, well, actually, she had one daughter, but she's passed. Uh, Walter had one daughter, Fanny, and we couldn't find her. James never married. Henry never married. Clifford had four children, but we have not been able to find those descendants as well. So we have Mariah and we have Lucy. And this is Mariah. 
And you can look at that face, and she looks, that face, especially around the mouth, looks exactly like Emily. This is Mariah as a young, as a young girl. And this is her as Grandma Moosh. If you've read the book, you know about Grandma Moosh. So Mariah had six children, John, Patty, Mary Elizabeth, James Benjamin, and, and Big Emily. And the reason these are bolded is because these are the only ones that we have pictures of. So this is, this is Mariah. This is Mary Elizabeth. This is Patty. And this is, they call her Big Emily. And this is the one that looks the most like, I think, in those faces. And uh, we have descendants of Patty's uh, daughter. So this is... The most information we got was from the Jones family. So this is uh, Mary Elizabeth in the center, and these are her children. And this is Stephen Jones. Stephen uh, graduated Armstrong, went to Virginia Union. He served in World War II and became a second lieutenant. After the war, he worked for the post office, and then when he retired, he taught handicapped children how to swim. That, the next one is um, Mary Lydia who is Aunt May. She was a fashion model at Tallheimer's and Miller and Rhodes. She also graduated from Virginia Union. She was widowed very early, um, and she was a part-time teacher. When she was in high school, she was voted, was named the most athletic female in the city of Richmond. This is Cornelia. This is Robbie's mom. <laughs> Cornelia Goins, and uh, she was a school teacher for 36 years in the Lynchburg area in the Rosenwald schools. If you haven't heard of those, he was the president of Sears and Roebuck, and he was inspired by Booker T. Washington, and he built 5,000 schools across the South for African American students and literally educated thousands of them. She was a teacher. Her husband was the principal. Next we have Uncle Pete, Walter Douglas Jones. He was a renowned educator. He went to Virginia Union, but also to NYU, and also to Wayne State University. He got a graduate degree. He became a famous educator in Michigan and Ohio. And in 1971, he was listed in Personalities of the South because of his accomplishments. This is Uncle Jack, who is... John Robert, and he was uh, a pianist, he was a conductor, he was a choir director, he went to NYU, he went to Manhattan School of Music, and he actually performed at Carnegie Hall and at the Lincoln Center. And actually, Kim just told me she has a program that I've, I've been looking for where he performed at one of those places, so we're going we're gonna to get our hands on that. And this is Emily Grace. She was the baby, and she was the one that gave me all the stories about Grandma Moosh, and she's the only one of them that's still alive. She's 96 now, I think, or maybe 97. And she went to Virginia Union, and she became a librarian at the Library of Congress. So this is a very accomplished family we have here, generation after generation after generation. I just wanted to put these faces up for you because they're so remarkable. Here is Emily. I want you to look at the, particularly the lower part. Look at Mariah. Look at big Emily. Look at Uncle Jack, although he's smiling, and, and Stephen. It's so clear to me. Uh, this is uh, Patty's daughter, Mariah. She married a Cogbill, and we have her daughter, uh, couldn't come today, but she's been very helpful, and, and, but she's a little bit ill. And this is Lucy's son, Alvin Lionel Hicks. Lucy was the youngest. Now, I, I should tell you that on Lucy's death certificate, David Winfrey is listed as her father, although we know that couldn't be possible. The current generation of Emily's family is just astounding. They came down to us for a reunion from Michigan, New Jersey, Maryland, Washington, D.C., Lynchburg, and Midlothian, Virginia. They have taken full advantage of their inheritance, which is intelligence, 
fortitude, love of family. Among them are four PhDs in science education and engineering, a high school counselor, one who started his own radio station, a college track star and coach, <laughs> and several highly successful business owners. And here are just some of them. Uh, this is Jamie, if you all don't know Jamie. And I said, Jamie, we've got to invite these people down. And uh, he said, sure, we'll give them a reception, we'll give them a tour. And most of them didn't know who Emily Winfrey was. They hadn't heard of her. And Emily Joy, who was supposed to be here today with us, who has now COVID, um, thought she was named after Big Emily. And I said, there's an Emily in every generation in this family. That's how revered she is. And by the way, Emily Joy, big shout out to you. Hope you're feeling better. Um, and here is just another better picture of them sideways. This is Emily Grace, the one that told me all about Grandma Moosh. And here they are in front of the cottage. So in closing, Emily Winfrey was the embodiment of strength and courage it took to get through these times, the where she lived and, and how she lived. And it's very important that this story be told because there aren't very many of them that we can tell. She was just one of millions of African-American women that went through this, whose stories were lost. They'll never be told. Not even their names are known. But we do know a lot about Emily. Her descendants are her legacy. As her great-great-granddaughter Emily says, I know I am standing on her sh shoulders. Just a plug, if you buy the book, it goes to the Emily Winfrey Education Fund. <laughs> And we're going to, uh, that's at the, here at the VMHC. So with that, I will finish, Joseph. Thank you. Do you want me to step back down or you want me to get the chairs? Yes. I'll get the chairs. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jan, and, and that's not the end of our program tonight. You know, we, we got the primer, we got the background information um, about Emily and her family, uh, and now what we're going to do next as we transition is to set up and actually give our panel discussion uh, with our panelist today, and so we'll mo be moving into that as well. Um, I also want to give you all a quick note, um, because as you heard through the uh, emergency alert alarms on your phones, um, there, were some, there were some weather conditions that are occurring. I want to let everyone know that we are okay, because this is actually our secure space for that, that situation. So the show, we are going to continue to go on uh, regardless of everything. We will be completely safe and secure in this space uh, as we set up for our next section. Um, so... Uh, we'll also have after our, or during our panel discussion, we will have the opportunity to ask questions as well. So if you do have those questions, I encourage you to hold on to them. Uh, we will be giving ample time for that part in our, our presentation today. Um, and now as we have put, as we put our final chairs into place, uh, I want to go ahead and uh, do the introductions for our additional people who will be joining us here on the stage. Uh, as we already have uh, talked with, introduced Dr. Jan Meck, I also want to bring up uh, our descendant uh, who will be joining us today. Um, as you may have noted in our program, initially we were to have uh, Dr. Emily Jones uh, to join us, but as we noted earlier, uh, she has come down with COVID, so our thoughts and prayers are with her and her family uh, as they navigate that. I do know that they are on the up. So things are looking, for, uh, looking up for them, uh, but of course we want to take every precaution possible to keep everyone safe and healthy. Um, so coming up uh, on behalf of the Winfrey family, or as a single individual, I'm not going to try to put the entire onus of the family on you, but uh, as a member of the Winfrey family is uh, Dr. Kimberly Mitchell. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is a public health professional with over 20 years of experience in epidemiology, disease surveillance, health education, and applied research. She currently works as a senior epidemiologist at PO uh, Consulting LLC. In that capacity, she leads 
leads an epidemiology team that supports the Defense Health Agency's Vision Center for, of Excellence uh, by providing analytical and technical support for research uh, projects examining eye injuries and other visual dysfunctions among service members and veterans. Uh, prior to her current role, she served as the chief of rabies and vector-borne diseases in the Infectious Disease Epidemiology Bureau in the Maryland Department of Health. Uh, Dr. Mitchell holds a Ph.D. in behavioral and community health from the University of Maryland, a Master of Public Health from Yale University, and a Bachelor of Arts from Cornell University. In her spare time, she enjoys contemporary jazz and dance reading and spending time with family and friends. And I do want to note very quickly, because I received this note earlier, it is actually more than 25 years of public health experience. Uh, so I would like to welcome to the stage Dr. Kimberly Mitchell. Also joining us on stage is Anna Edwards. Anna is a public historian, museum educator, and historic preservation and social justice advocate based in Richmond, Virginia. She's the founding chair of the Virginia's Defenders Sacred Ground Historical Reclamation Project and the group which worked for eight years to reclaim the uh, Richmond's African burial ground in Chaco Bottom and is currently engaged in the community struggle to preserve and memorialize historic Chaco Bottom through the establishment of a nine acre memorial park and educational campus uh, her experience includes university and conference presentations the organizational of organization of forums and symposia historical uh, consultations journal and book publications and radio production which i had the great pleasure of uh, working with you on a little while ago as well uh, and she holds a bachelor's degree in visual arts from California State Polytechnic University, uh, Panoma, and a master's degree in history from Virginia Commonwealth University. Anna Edwards, welcome to the stage as well. As I kind of start to make this transition out to uh, here, we'll just invite everyone to take a seat and we can start our conversations. Um, because I think that this is a really important point to, to bring up is how powerful it is to hear the story of Emily Winfrey um, and to have all that information compiled, uh, but knowing that the work itself <laughs> uh, is not something that always, we have to start from someplace, right? Uh, so I guess the first question that we have is for you, uh, Jan, is you know, why did you undertake this project in the first place? Understood. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead and try that one again. Okay. L3 seems to be a is little that, bit. There we go. Okay. <laughs> after I came back to Richmond after my career at NASA, I, as you said, I started being a docent and I realized there were a lot of stories that they were telling that I had never heard of before. And so I decided that I was going to find out those stories. And I was reading all of these books about Gabriel and Nat Turner and Madison Washington and every, all these heroes, James, um, James Lafayette, Henry Box Brown. And there was this cottage down there that I didn't know too much about. And then Jamie came along, started asking me all these questions. And I realized, well, Nothing had been written about just somebody like Emily, somebody who just persevered and survived. She didn't have a book. She didn't have anything. Uh, and, but she was the majority. She represented the majority of those people. And so that's when I decided this story just had to, just had to be told, and she had to be honored, and we had to fix that cottage. Well, that's, that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that kind of work is incredibly important, especially as you're mentioning um, you know, the, those, those other heroes, those histories whose names have been uh, kind of started to be chronicled in many ways. Yeah. And I, I would kind of want to kind of toss over to Anna really quickly because I know that she's done work uh, surrounding one of those, those uh, men, uh, or actually a couple of them if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and how you came to the work of uh, doing work around Shaco Bottom and talking about Gabriel, especially. Mm. Yeah, it's it's good that you start by mentioning you know Gabriel is sort of one of those heroic figures, somebody who that has been written about, um, and and also because a lot of the times uh, people like that get mythologized, 
Um, and you know, we, we uh, try to unpack what we can know about uh, people about whom there are often very few records uh, and sort of trying to piece together those lives and get a sense of, of what they were actually like. Um, my, my introduction to Shaco Bottom came uh, from being involved in social justice work. Um, I met my husband-to-be uh, back in 2002, and uh, he was already an activist. And as we were paying attention to sort of the historical reasons for why uh, many of the conditions for people in Richmond exist the way that, that we do, um, we uh, uh, came across, or he, he actually already knew about it, but I also separately learned about the story of Gabriel's Rebellion. And that story uh, led me, uh, or led us to meet people who were um, beginning to talk about this burying ground that was down in Shackle Bottom. And so um, without telling the entire story and us uh, waking up five hours from now, um, it, the, site, the, the fact that there was a place that we could associate with this uh, incredible story of Gabriel's Rebellion which had always been articulated as a failed rebellion, as opposed to um, a, a chapter of Richmond's history, a chapter of uh, expressing the, the conditions of life for black Virginians or black Richmonders in that particular time period. The fact that it took place you know, in places that we recognize today, um, and that we could put our feet on those places and have some connection to this history, which again, when we look or we read books um, or especially commemorative things. It's, it's such a snapshot. So we don't really get a strong sense of who people are and the place in which they lived. And so um, I'll just say that all of that, um, for me anyway, in terms of eventually turning me into an actual historian, um, really resonated because it was a, a beginning of, of actually connecting to historical figures as real people. Absolutely. And I know through that work, you've also connected with descendants of those of those folks as well. And of mm -hmm. course, Jan, now you've gotten the great chance to work with the descendants. And I, and before I get back to you, I kind of want to ask um, uh, Kim for you. You're learning and getting to and, and getting to connect with a lot of these things and in ways that maybe hadn't been available to you immediately when you were growing up. You know, I, I, I can empathize with that as a descendant of enslaved people uh, or people enslaved in Hanover County. I didn't know necessarily about my ancestors until a book came out. Uh, well, we would hear some stories, but it was a book that came out about J uh, George Washington Fields, his brother. And then we find out more about James. And so I, I just recounting on my own personal journey. I'm also fascinated to hear if when you were learning more about Emily, what kind of things were, what recollections were coming up? What kind of things were, connections were happening that you were finding out? There, there were uh, a few of them that, um, that uh, stirred in me once I started learning about Emily Winfrey. Um, one of them was um, Grandma Moosh, um, because I would often in my conversations with my great aunt Emily, that would be Emily Grace, who is now 96 and the, on, the only surviving member of those six children, um, she would often talk about um, her grandma Moosh and being a child and her grandmother being such a wonderful loving figure who would always comfort her and care for her and hold her on her lap and play with her, um, which was fascinating to me because it seemed like a contradiction as I was telling Jan earlier today when I would look at the one of the pictures that was shown here earlier of grandma Moosh, also known as Mariah, um, and she always looked so stern and so almost mean. <laughs> and so when I would see that picture hanging in my great aunt's house, I thought, oh gosh, she looks like someone not very friendly. <laughs> so, <laughs> So it was really very illuminating to me to actually read the story about Mariah um, and what she was actually like um, as a person, not just as a child growing up, but once she became a mother herself and a grandmother to these children and how incredibly playful and loving she was. So it was fascinating to learn about that um, in real time. Um, and also just about those six children. Um, because I often would just hear stories from my mom and my grandmother, who was uh, Mary Lydia, who was also one of one of the six, um, just about how they were always jostling for attention and you know elbowing each other and getting on each other's nerves as siblings do. Um, and so I, that's why I particularly was endeared by how the book opened, with all of them trying to listen in on grown folks' conversation in another room, because that sounded very typical to things I'd heard as a child growing up. 
And Jan, I, I kind of... I, 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 and that's, I think that's why this next question is most, is most appropriate, right? Is, is as you got to know the family, as you got to connect with folks, as you were writing this book and working with, with Virginia on it, and you got to meet the people who were the descendants of this great woman, uh, what were your thoughts? What were some of your thoughts as you got to know them? Yeah, it's, uh, it's just blown me away, the, this family, both the people we met from Lucy's uh, family and, and Mariah's family. I, when we first when we first found these these people, and I, I told Jamie, you need to write a letter. I'm not going to just cold call these people. You know, from a, who are you? And it has to be on letterhead. And, and it said, Dr. Meck will be calling you. So I'm calling and calling. The first one I called was Robbie because he's a DJ, and I thought he would talk. <laughs> <laughs> And I was right. He's a, he's a talker, aren't you, Robbie? And you're with the board, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll get that. And, um, and so then I started calling the others, and they'd call Robbie and say, well, who is this woman? You know, and he'd say, oh, she's okay, she's okay. And, but they had never heard of Emily Winfrey until this, this old lady answered the phone. I was trying to call Emily. And... Um, I said, did you get this letter? And she said, yeah, I know about that. And I said, um, did you ever hear of Emily Winfrey? And she said, I know about Emily Winfrey. I was named after her. And that just, I started to cry, of course, and it just opened up. And she's also a talker, as you, as you guys know. And she started talking about Grandma Moosh. And I thought, this is just amazing. And then Robbie started telling me about all of Musha's uh, grandchildren, and it just kind of built up from there. And every everyone I met, I'm like, this is this is just incredible. These people are incredible, and they've just built on this. And they, but they didn't know where it came from, where they came from. And it was just so. It's just been so wonderful. Emily Joy, I just loved to death, and Kim and Ellie and. So when the book came out, Emily Grace's daughter, Eleanor, called me and she said, Mama wants to talk with you and, and thank you, because she was the one that gave me most of what's in the book, actually. And we just had the most lovely conversation. And she's, I gave her the first picture that we got from the Library of Virginia. We framed, and I had it at the reunion, and I gave it to her, because I was just so touched when she saw it. And it's hanging up in her room at the at the home where she is now and it's just it's this their story you know it's not my story it's their story and to hear what they think about it just is overwhelming no oh, absolutely i i, I kind of want to bring it back to you then kimberly too is a in hearing this in hearing a kind of the impact that um Emily's had on people who, Emily's life has had on people who have not been part of the family and have not connected with the family necessarily, um, but then reflecting on it for yourself, with that new knowledge, what, is there anything that you kind of take away from it? Is there any, anything that you feel in particular um, about learning more about Emily? Yes, uh, I would say that I do. Um, I think since learning more about Emily, it, it makes me recognize um, and you said this in your slide as well, that, that she had such tremendous resilience um, and strength of character and just fortitude to uh, endure and overcome all of the many, many seemingly insurmountable obstacles that she faced um, in her life. Even after slavery ended, um, obviously there were so many um, other hurdles put in front of her legally, financially, logistically, um, in every possible way. And, and I would like to think that I do still see some of that resilience in my own family members, and I think at least a little in myself um, <laughs> also. Um, but what, one of the things I was gonna say is, uh, one of the things that I've always observed among all of my family members, especially my parents um, and grandparents and great aunts and uncles, is that there has always been this push um, for education. Mm -hmm. especially among us as black people, but in my family in particular, I always remember my parents saying, go to school, go to grad school, it's not enough to go to undergrad, get as, get as much ac educational achievement as possible. And I'm not the only one who got that message. I know that my cousins did too. My cousin, Dr. Emily Joy Jones, who was not able to be here today because of COVID, she also has her PhD like me, and I know she 
I had the same resolve <laughs> and determination to complete that, um, just as did her father with his PhD in music, um, and just all of our other family members who persevered to pursue the things that they knew were important um, and to achieve things and to, um, and also to get further than generations before them. Because um, I think that's another thing that I note among my own family, among my parents and others, that they always, parents always want to see their children um, surpass them and have better careers or better educations. Um, and, and that's another thing that I would infer from the book and from Emily Winfrey's story that I think she wanted for her children and her grandchildren. And so I think that's why she made so many sacrifices and worked so hard. Um, oh, and also, uh, that's what I was gonna say. Um, the, the fact that she did have that house and that cottage and that land and that she, um, I think, tried to be strategic about how to hang on to it mm -hmm. for as long as possible. Um, I, I feel like she recognized, even without knowing how to read or write or not having that type of formal education, she recognized the value of home ownership. And I think that has also been passed down through generations in our family. I know my parents, um, after I had finished my master's and had moved into an apartment, and I was very, feeling very independent in my apartment, I was very comfortable, and I was only there for two years, and my dad said, why are you still in an apartment? You're making a landlord rich, get a house. You know? so, so, um, and I did subsequently buy a house, um, but, but I felt like, I think that is another mantra that I think is one of the lessons from Emily Winfrey um, that is passed down through all of us, and so it, um, it is very meaningful to me to know that that um, has, has been maintained in our family. Absolutely. You know, uh, Mariah couldn't read or write either, but Emily Grace was telling me how she was insistent that they get their education, and Emily Grace would um, read Mariah's letters to her and write letters for her, uh, to her, her, especially her son in California, and uh, she was determined to get an education, but she said a bigger driver than that was that she wanted to get a house with more than one bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. With, with many children. Yeah. I, I kind of want to bring back on that education piece, too. Um, Anna and I both are, are uh, people who talk a lot about the period of enslavement, late and early enslavement in the United States. Um, and when you were discussing earlier, uh, Jan, we were talking about what people had and whether or not what Emily is feeling at that moment at, at the end, yeah. right, of where when slavery is coming to a close, uh, when it's being forcibly overturned in this city by the arms of black men, right? Uh, and in this way, we see that this period where people are, have no money, have no education, have no job, as you had mentioned, and we think about it is that they've never been paid in many cases. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an intentional act. They've never been paid. They've been denied education specifically um, through uh, acts of the General Assembly. And in many ways, when they're coming out of this period, when they're looking at their, their, the space and the prospects above them, they have skills but no place to exercise them because there aren't people who are willing to pay for what they haven't paid for before. Mm -hmm. And so as Emily's entering into this period and she's influencing, I'm hoping maybe Anna, you, you might be able to think, to talk more about the power of black women in pushing forward educational aspects, especially in the period both prior to the end of, uh, of enslavement and then afterwards as well. Um. That wasn't in the um, planning. <laughs> yes, I didn't see that. <laughs> but um, well, you know, so it it does speak to it speaks to it, there is a there's a really interesting aspect of it seems obvious to us today that getting an education is is the way forward, right? Is the way through and and beyond, um, and it seems obvious as you know at this point that um, people who were denied an education would upon uh, receiving freedom are looking at the things that they can th that represent freedom for them and so the ability to get an education represents the difference between being free and being enslaved being able to um, actually sign a legal marriage agreement uh, was something that happened once slavery was ended and black people became actual citizens of the country which they were not before um, and uh, the idea of uh, women's roles in pushing for and achieving um, the rights of citizenship are also the rights of, hu of humanity, right, human rights. 
And throughout the decades uh, during slavery, when uh, black people are fighting for citizenship, even during slavery, right? Because there are free black people uh, in that period as well. Um, it, it gets distilled at a certain point down to the struggle between black men and, and white women being able to achieve uh, the full political rights. Um, and, and we don't get to hear that much about black women uh, striving because, again, it's about men getting the right to vote. And, and then the struggle for women was about white women. So what are black women doing throughout that, that period? Well, they are known for fighting for the sort of broader range of human rights. So they are fighting for education even before slavery comes to an end. And they are fighting for, um, for health care. They are fighting for better living conditions. They are fighting for you know, all the things that we now associate with sort of social service safety nets and things. This is sort of the realm um, of black women um, in, in that period. And so to see that Emily gets to be, you know, for us here in Richmond and now and in this moment, she gets to be the person that we can refer to as exemplifying um, all of those struggles through that. Um, and there are ways to pick apart her specific uh, history in relationship to a man who was a medical doctor by training. Even if he didn't practice it, he went through the processes and the training that he would have gotten at the University of Virginia um, would have been co common to others getting that training in that period, which would tie him to the history of, for example, grave robbing for the purposes of having uh, cadavers on which to study. Uh, and that in places like Virginia and Georgia, where the prominent medical schools are in, sla uh, in states where slavery is the dominant uh, sort of repository for, as they called it, anatomical material for study. Um, so not to say that Emily's got a direct specific connection to that, but just to say that um, But you can start with um, one person's story and you can connect it to um, many of the larger historical stories. But, and the idea, again, that women um, are at the uh, center of the push uh, for education for all kinds of reasons uh, is, is entirely valid. Absolutely, fantastic. And I, I kind of want to bring us quickly to um, uh, this very important space um, in that prior, just this earlier this week on Monday, um, a really great announcement was made, uh, or, or action was taken by the Richmond City Council. Um, on Monday, 14 June, Richmond City Council voted to allocate $500,000 for the moving, repair, rehabilitation, and interpretation of Emily Winfrey's cottage. So that cottage that we saw the picture of, which has been sitting in Chaco Bottom for nearly 20 years, it is identified by the city as a, uh, a, lo a, a location has been identified by the city in South Richmond. Still need to work out with the community about exactly what that location is going to look like, where that, uh, what that, uh, uh, the area is going to be. But we can say for certain at this moment that it would be an area that would be familiar to Emily. And so that in many ways, this will be as a homecoming for that cottage, for the family, and for Emily herself. Um, and we're very much looking forward to seeing that progress. Now, um, I, under other circumstances, I would love to continue on and then move on to our Q&A. Unfortunately, the weather conditions have gotten a little bit more dire. So we want to... Uh, So we'll be right back with y'all. <laughs> Talk it's amongst yourselves. We're going to be trapped here overnight. What's going on out there? I don't know. I know that there it was earlier today. I think it was earlier today.
Okay. So we are um, we are going to reconvene for a little bit here. Um, we do want to invite uh, uh, Kim Chin to the stage uh, so that we can uh, <laughs> bring up here. Uh, you'll go around this way. Yes. Think that way. There's no stairs over there. Yeah. You could try. <laughs> There's no stairs. Yeah. Absolutely, and we have that chair for you. Um, and Kim, I would uh, I would love it if you would give uh, an introduction for yourself about how you came to this, and it, the mic should be on, and, and just if you could give an introduction about how you came to this and be a, and what your involvement is, especially in the most recent uh, city council decisions. All right. Um, well, my name is Kim Chen. I'm a senior manager with the city of Richmond. My connection to the Winfrey Cottage actually goes back to its originally being moved 20 years ago. I was on the board of directors of an organization called the Alliance, I can't talk, Alliance to Conserve Old Richmond Neighborhoods. And we had a panicked gentleman come running into our office with a stack of deeds in his hand and he said, they're gonna tear this little cottage down if we don't move it in 48 hours. So a bunch of us scrambled and found somebody that could move it and it's been sitting in Chaco Bottom for 20 years. So full circle, I am, I've been at the city of Richmond, I'm an architect and historian, architectural historian by trade and planner. Um, and I've been working with the city for a number of years as a preservation planner um, most recently became a senior manager and working in the deputy chief administrator's office doing special projects and primarily preservation projects and primarily projects in Chaco Bottom. And we recognized that we needed to move the cottage, finally, that being in Chaco Bottom was not, and I refer to it as her. To me, she's a very special embodiment um, and we need we knew we needed to move her but I was determined that it was not just going to be we're just going to move it I wanted to make sure that we found a place that was meaningful we have found a location in South Richmond not very far from the Stockton Street house it it really will be bringing the cottage home it will be bringing it back to places that Emily would have been familiar with. So I went to my boss and I said, I need some money. Can I rearrange my budget? She was in full support of doing that. We worked very closely with the mayor and his administrative staff and with city council and they voted unanimously Monday night to let me rearrange a budget so that we could allocate $500,000 that we can use to move the cottage to a what I think when we can finally really talk about it, I think everybody will think is a wonderful location. Um, we can finally move the cottage. We can put it on a real foundation. <laughs> we can fix the things that need to be fixed and work very closely with the family to figure out how to best tell this remarkable story through this remarkable little cottage that has really been as resilient <laughs> <laughs> as, as Emily was in, in her life. And I'm just, I'm, to me, this is like capstone career-wise to finally be able to do something that is this meaningful mm -hmm. and to be just a little part and just a real nudge. Everybody in my office will tell you that I just, I bug everybody to death. We need to do this, we need to do this, we're gonna do this now, and this is how we're doing it. And I fortunately have had a boss who listens to that. So, bringing it around back to the panel then to kind of give our, our closing thoughts on it, I wanna start with you, Jan, and um, what your thoughts are about the, the future of the cottage now that we kind of are, what are your hopes, I guess, are for it? 
Well, we want to start the Friends of the Cottage Fund, first of all. Uh, we want to make it an educational venue to tell Emily's story and to tell, make it a place where school children can come and learn about their heritage and be proud, be proud of that and be proud of Emily and honor the family. And it's just, it's just going to be fantastic. I mean, we don't, we're just, this is the, end of the beginning. Now we're going to the stage where we're going to actually do something. Absolutely. Thank you. And Anna, um, how does the past of this cottage uh, serve the future, especially now that it's going to be part of the public landscape, part of that public history? <laughs> I wrote that question. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I didn't think it was going to come to me. But <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really exciting because um, for as long as you know, she, Kim was there when they moved it. <laughs> Anna and I have known each other and <laughs> struggled time. over these things for a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. The, the cottage has just been there. It's been a part of this landscape without, you know, it's just been sitting there. And resilience really is the word because it's managed to survive c complete and utter exposure uh, all those years. It's only been three years since it was repainted and patched up. Mm -hmm. um, so for the better part of, you know, 15 to 18 years, it really was just sitting there. Um, it had a porch. It had a, a roof over the porch. It had stairs that led to the back door and led to the front steps, and all of those fell away over those years. Um, and for the, the period of time that it's been sitting on um, the site near the Lumpkins Jail, uh, archaeology, archaeology site, um, people have over the years photographed it and labeled it Lumpkin's Jail. Yeah. Uh, so it has not had its identity proper uh, for all of that time. So now, finally, with you know research into who Emily actually was, clearing up some of the sort of the urban legends, right, and um, and really uh, talking about the house. Coincidentally, um, I was I decided to go back to school to get um, a, a master's degree in history, and one of the classes was material culture, and the 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 the, the piece of material culture that jumped into my head for my assignment was the Winfrey Cottage because I, I always walk past it, I always talk about it on my tours. I did stick my head up through the floor <laughs> and take some photographs of the inside when it was still in ra really ragged shape. And so I got to see the layout um, of the inside of, of, the, of the cottage. So I wrote a paper about it. And in the course of writing that paper, I, I started to try and imagine what it was like to be this woman who had lived all of her life enslaved. And then there was going to be this morning when her children are sleeping, okay, this is me putting myself like literally there, um, but her children are sleeping and, and the sun is coming up and she's standing in the doorway and the day before had been slavery and the day after was freedom. And what was going through her mind as I hoped she was sipping on a cup of coffee and just <laughs> <laughs> looking into the rising sun and, and trying to sort of imagine uh, the profound shift that that represented and yet, also represented the fact that in five minutes later, she was going to have to be deeply involved in what daily life meant. Mm -hmm. How was she going to feed them? Um, were they going to get the education that she thought was going to be so important for them? Um, was she going to be able to keep a roof over their head? What on earth was that land going to do for her? Um, all of those questions and things that she was going to have to deal with. Um, and then your book putting her in that larger context of um, the rise and fall of reconstruction, the rise and fall of opportunity, um, the fact that black people saw this moment and worked hard to make it the most it could possibly be and then to have it systemically uh, withdrawn uh, so that her grandchildren, uh, her children, but really her grandchildren would face that sort of repression that would represent looking very much like an enslaved society again in the 20th century. Um, and yet, and yet they had that that um, they had that push, they had that upbringing, they had that message uh, to to keep to keep pushing uh, anyway. So it's yeah. it's, a, it's a remarkable thing, and it will. Um, the last thing I'll say is that um, well, I was trying to find the I wanted to find out who built it, right? Because ordinary architecture nobody claims. There's, architects don't claim building regular houses. 
Um, and so it couldn't find that. So the term for that is vernacular. Vernacular means ordinary, everyday mm -hmm. architecture. And so here we have this house, vernacular house, and Emily, a vernacular life, right? Um, but it's, it's everything, because that's what, as you say, most people live, ordinary lives. And um, then I'll give the last word for this to, to Kim. <laughs> and I, I know that you've been brought into this discussion even uh, relatively recently. You know, only just as we, <laughs> just as we were finding out who could, who could attend and who couldn't. Um, and so I, I believe then that gives you kind of the ability to provide us with the freshest thoughts on what this moment means for you personally and what it might mean for the future descendants of Emily Winfrey? Um, well, I, I gosh, um, I, it, this, this whole gathering, this event is, is incredibly meaningful to me um, because as you alluded to, I had never heard of Emily Winfrey. I didn't know I had an ancestor by then. I knew we had a lot of Emilys <laughs> in our family, but I thought they were either named after my great aunt or big Emily, um, yeah. but I didn't know there was anyone before that. Um, so that whole process of learning about her and seeing the book once it came to fruition has, has been so illuminating. And now to know that th her cottage has been preserved and is being restored and will be brought back home um, to have that homecoming in that neighborhood that is so familiar to her and her loved ones, that is, it's hard to put into words um, how meaningful that is. Um, and I do actually, and Jan, you, you said a lot of what I wanted to say earlier, <laughs> but no, when, um, just as far as, I guess, what I would like to see happen in the future, um, I would very much, I had that kind of same thought that I would love for the cottage to be an educational um, venue for, for the people and young people in particular, especially the young children of color, to be able to pass through there and learn about her story and learn um, all of the, um, just there were a lot of things that I learned when I read the book, um, just about the history of, of civil injustice in Virginia. I knew about Jim Crow, but I didn't know specifically about some of the specific vagrancy laws and border restriction laws and anti-miscegenation and all of the yeah. myriad of, of different legislative hurdles that were immediately um, thrown in front of people of color the minute slavery ended. Um, and so I want other young people to learn about the, that history in general, not just about Emily Winfrey, um, but also just to know that the these are things that can be overcome, mm -hmm. and that they and their families can have their own story as well. And so that was what I would like to see people take away from it um, once it is fully restored and becomes uh, this, this um, hopefully, kind of hub of, of um, education um, and inspiration. Um, so that's, that's what it means to me. Wonderful. And I, I thank you all, everyone who is for, for joining us up here on stage, for, for sharing your thoughts, sharing your stories, and um, for bringing a lot more light to this, these kinds of conversations. Uh, and again, I'll just say it out loud again one more time that this is the moment to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. On the eve of Juneteenth, as we approach this moment where we are thinking about what does emancipation mean? <coughs> What does freedom mean? What does liberation mean? When we see Juneteenth as the end of one struggle, but then the start of another, but with different stakes, with knowing that freedom is still there, knowing that the descendants, as you mentioned, are, are able to, to, to wake up and walk in freedom, knowing that there is a future on the horizon for Emily, for her family, for her cottage, and for everyone else who's affected by those spaces in the city of Richmond, in the former city of Manchester, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, in what is it, Washington, D.C., Michigan, and everywhere else where the descendants have, stayed, have put their feet. And we think about how, as we've said here numerous times now, that this is an everyday story of an everyday person who provided extraordinary guidance. And her legacy continues on through that. I think that it's impressive that we get to join in that and then we get to enact that in our own lives, in our own day, so that when someday we have our own legacies coming up and we are adding to this rich, rich tapestry that is the story of Virginia. I'm very glad that you were able to bring us all together for this and I'm very glad we were able to have this conversation today. So thank you.